<laughs> Isaiah chapter 53. And he shall grow up as a tender plant before him and as a root out of a thirsty ground. There is no beauty in him, nor comeliness. And we have seen him, and there was no sightliness that we should be desirous of him. Despised and the most abject of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with infirmity, and his look was as it were hidden and despised, whereupon we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our sorrows, and we have thought him as it were a leper, and as one struck by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our iniquities, he was bruised for our sins. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, every one has turned aside into his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was offered because it was his own will, and he opened not his mouth. He shall be led as a sheep to the slaughter, and shall be <coughs> dumb as a lamb before his shearer, and he shall not open his mouth. He was taken away from distress and from judgment, who shall declare his generation? Because he is cut off out of the land of the living, for the wickedness of my people have I struck him. And the Lord was pleased to bruise him in infirmity. If he shall lay down his life for sin, he shall see a long-lived seed, and the will of the Lord shall be prosperous in his hands. He has delivered his soul unto death, and was reputed with the wicked, and has borne the sins of many, and has prayed for his transgressors. This was written 750 years before our Lord came, and you have all the accuracies of the Passion. The Most Blessed Virgin Mary, as already a young girl in the temple, studying in the temple with the other virgins, she would have read all these with great attention and great care, because in her heart she longed for the Redeemer. And at age three, she consecrated her virginity to God in order to bring the Redeemer down. She didn't know yet that she was chosen to be that mother of the Redeemer, but she saw and understood that in her mind that whoever is going to be the mother of this Messiah, she's going to suffer a lot. She knew that. And indeed, she was the chosen. And the Blessed Virgin Mary, who married St. Joseph in a legal true marriage, St. Joseph also made a vow of chastity and virginity at age 12 to bring the same thing, to bring the Redeemer down from heaven. So let us pick up where we left off last night, which was our Lord in the dungeon. And by this time, already he's lost a lot of blood. The tortures of the dungeon were horrible and brutal. And men can be cruel to men. Men can be barbarians. They can be pretty savage. When I talk to some Vietnam vets, they're a little ashamed by what they did as young men, ruthless young men. They're, they're a bit ashamed and embarrassed to say, yeah, we did this and that to the Viet Cons. But at that time, I didn't care. And some brutal tortures. So men can be cruel. And when men are driven by the devil, and some of them possessed, as certainly some of the Jews were, there was the devils also unleashing their rage on our Lord Jesus Christ. So at 6 a.m. was the trial before Pontius Pilate, around there, early in the morning. And then 7 a.m. he is sent to Herod. Herod mocks our Lord, dresses him in white, as Samson was many centuries before. 
At eight in the morning, our Lord re is returned to Pilate. And it's here, Pilate is in a bind, and he thinks, well, I'll get out of it if I just present Barabbas. Barabbas, nobody cares about this criminal. He's a real criminal. There's nothing attractive about him. He's a barbarian, and he deserves to die. Surely they're going to ask to, re to release Christ. But Pontius Pilate is taken by surprise. Even this Roman praetorium, this man of the praetorium, Ro Pontius Pilate, representing Rome, even he is taken back by the wickedness and malice of these Jews. And he's kind of shocked by the ones leading the crowds. The ones who are bloodthirsty are the priests, <laughs> the high priests and the elders and the, the, the Sanhedrin. They're, they're supposed to be the meek and humble and prayerful ones. And there they are. Pilate looks down and sees them. They're in the front row clamoring for blood of this innocent lamb, Jesus Christ the King. And there you see the face of Satan and Christ. The light and darkness that clash. Because these men, these Jews, these high priests, headed by Caiaphas and Annas, who were truly evil men, and rejected the Redeemer right before their eyes. They rejected the miracles that he did right in front of them. And, and if, you want, if you want to read a very kind of humorous account of how, how silly and how revengeful these Jews became, read St. John chapter 9. It's about the blind man who's been there all his life begging at the gate. And then our Lord says, do you want to see? He says, yes. And our Lord takes some spit, the spit that Christ will use to cure this man, mix it with mud. In return for that goodness and kindness, our Lord will be covered with spit by these mockers. And with his own saliva, he'll mix some mud, pour it on, smear it on his eyes, and goes to tell him, go wash your eyes in the pool of Siloe, which means the one sent. So our Lord, does, there's no action he doesn't do with, without a meaning, without a deep connection. All right, so he says, okay, I, I got to go, someone lead me to that pool. And he makes his way and he washes his eyes and he looks and he sees his first sight would have been splashing water, and then his probably his own reflection in the water. He never saw himself before. Maybe he got a little scared. <laughs> what is that? And then he looked up and saw people looking at him. So the account is quite humorous because the authorities find out, the authorities of the temple, which is the high priests, and they're all upset. They're angry and said, who did this? And he said, I don't know. A man came to me and said, you want to be cured? I said, yes. He told me, "Put smear this mud on. I washed at the pool of Siloe, which for the Pharisees and high priests and the Sanhedrin was a grace because he's the one sent. Who's this one sent? The one that cured him. But they will refuse him. So they call a huge meeting. They even call his parents. Tell us who cured him. How is he cured? And the mother and father say, we know that's our son. We know what he looks like, but how he sees, we don't know. And then the blind man speaks up, and he really has a good time with these Jews. He says, it's, it's the one who cured me. He, certainly, he, he must be close to God, because God hears him. Look, I see now. Why, why are you so upset? He basically says, do you want to be his disciple also? And then they really go through the roof. And then they, they look for Christ, but they can't find him. And later the blind man is on his own. And he's being driven out of the temple because he's not to mention the name of the one who cured him. And our Lord comes up to him and says, do you believe that I cured you. 
Are you the one, Lord? And he said, yes, I'm the one that cured you. And he knelt down and adored him as God. He adored him. <clears throat> so, so the clash is, is built up here on this very day, Good Friday. And here we are. It is 2.10 p.m. This is the last hour of our Lord. He was actually hanging on the cross on that first Good Friday. There's no words that can communicate to, to us the suffering our Lord is in right now. Think of this third hour hanging on the cross. He's already been hanging two whole hours, which seems like an endless eternity. You know how you, when you suffer, time seems to go so slow. And our Lord, every minute just seems forever and ever. He's hanging on the nails. One of the nails is through his median nerve, so it's, it's constantly feeling like a, a drill being drilled into the nerves of the teeth. And the nerves shock the whole body. It puts, it puts shock waves, and it feels like burning fire in the veins and in the nervous system, like it's constantly burning intensely on fire. And then on top of that, it's the, it's the second hour of darkness because the eclipse, which was witnessed by Dionysius and many in Egypt where the, where the skies are clear, they saw this rapid move of the, of the moon blocking the sun for three hours. They saw it. It's recorded in history. And they couldn't explain. And, and one of them said in Egypt, either... either we're coming to the end of the world, or a God has died. And God was dying on the cross. So here it is, it's dark, and the winds are picking up. So what does that do when the muscles are already stretched out, and the coldness sets in, and the muscles start contracting, and they start forming huge bulges on his arms and legs, and it just feels like it just feels like he's being racked, like many martyrs will be racked, that is stretched out uh, so that their tendons rip, their sockets of their shoulders give out, they're dislocated. And our Lord never, there was no bone broken, but he certainly was a, had a dislocated shoulder. That is, when they were nailing him, they nailed him already in the left wrist. Then they took the chains and tried to get his hand and wrist over the hole, but they made it too wide. So they got the chain and yanked his arm and pulled it right out of the socket and then nailed him through the hand. So you have one nail in the hand and one nail through the wrist. Now that's according to some of the mystics. There's a lot to dispute on this. Some say it with both wrists, some say... But whatever it was, it didn't tickle. And it was excruciatingly painful. Doesn't matter. And so our Lord is uh, nailed through and then nailed in the feet. The shroud shows that, according to some, though who have studied the shroud, that there was no foot rest. That it was just one nail through both feet in the most awkward position. Some say there was a footrest and there was, he was nailed through. Again, footrest or no footrest, it's extremely painful. And in the feet, there are tender nerves. If you don't believe me, go walk on some thorns. <laughs> go walk on just some rocks. So our Lord is, at this hour, the second hour hanging on the cross, he's already getting weaker. His, he's in a state of suffocation. So he's struggling now to get every single breath. He has to fight for every breath. He has to push down on the nail in his feet, pull down on the nails in his wrist, causing the burning fire sensation throughout his whole nerves, and whistle in a breath, and then sag back down and let the air out. And he has to fight for the next breath. He's suffocating. What an agony. 
Maybe some of you all almost drowned when you were young. Or, and when you almost drown, you have that feeling of suffocation. You're, you're, you're panicking. And our Lord is, in a way, panicking to breathe. <coughs> and picture the Mother of God, picture the Virgin Mary at the foot of the cross. She has suffered everything our Lord has suffered, the scourging, the crowning with thorns, the whole way of the cross, the night in the dungeon. It's all, she suffered it all in her heart. And now she hears our Lord trying to breathe. Can you imagine a mother in front of her son who's panting to try to breathe? I mean, some mothers who have children that are as, asthmatic, that have asthma, and they panic, you know, to, to help them breathe when they have their, uh, their attacks. But to see our Lord in this state of suffocation had to be extremely painful for the mother of God. And extremely painful for the heart of Jesus because he, he loved his mother so much that to see her suffering because of him <laughs> caused him much more suffering. And that's just the mystery of the deep love of the Sacred Heart of Jesus and Mary. So our Lord is also another, another angle. Remember, Calvary is the place where they used to throw the dead bodies after crucifixion. They just left them there to die and be eaten by animals. And then you got this rotting flesh, which stinks up there, like rotting flesh, human flesh, which is the worst. And guess what that attracts? Big flies, big Mediterranean flies. And when our Lord's hanging on the cross, he's an open wound, remember. Flies love open wounds. When you're in the dry areas, like um, New Mexico, I was at the monastery there for three and a half years. It's very dry. And these kamikaze flies, they'll go right for your eyeballs. They don't care. They just go right for your eyeballs because they want to drink your saliva. So, <laughs> so you got to, of course, defend your eyeballs. <clears throat> but the, the flies are extra thirsty and they attack like kamikazes. And in these dry, arid climates, those flies were crawling all over our dear Lord, laying their eggs in him, crawling in his eyes, his mouth, his ears. You know how it drives you crazy. Our Lord, has, he can't shoo him away. His hands are nailed. So he suffered even from his littlest creatures, the flies. For all our little sins as well, all our little venial sins and imperfections and little lack of love of God, lack of perseverance, he suffered for all that as well. So see our Lord with the flies crawling in his eyes, in his mouth, which is now caked. His mouth, he has no more saliva. He has an extreme case of what we call cotton mouth. All he can taste is dry blood. His, his tongue is swollen. He's panting for air. And he truly physically thirsts, obviously. He's probably, he's dying of thirst because he's lost so much blood. One of the effects of hyp, hypovolemic shock is, here's the symptoms, anxiety, clammy, cool skin, confusion, de decreased or no urine output, generalized weakening, paleness, rapid breathing, sweaty skin, a rapid heart rate, and an extreme thirst. So our Lord, among his seven words on the cross, he shouts that, I thirst. He shouts it, I thirst. So, of course, the guards, they have a, maybe a little compassion. Maybe Lon, by this time, Longinus may be seen that this is, this is more than just some man. So the guards put some... Um, the sponge mixed with aloe and gall and vinegar. Which, according to some, have said that this mixture 
kind of alleviated the, the sharp pain of the dying victim. It was so, a sort of painkiller. But our Lord wouldn't drink it. He didn't, he didn't drink it. He tasted it, but he wouldn't drink. He didn't drink to not to, to alleviate his thirst, but to make the point that he, of course, thirsts for souls. He thirsts for your love. He thirsts for our love. He thirsts for our whole being to love and be ordered to his glory. This is what our Lord wants. This is what he really thirsts for. So remember that when you're thirsty, when you feel thirst, and we have the joy of a nice cool glass of water and a nice cold drink, maybe sometimes hold off just a few minutes and just remember how our Lord thirsted and how he thirsted for my love, our love, our whole mind, our whole soul, our whole devotion. He wants everything. Our God is a burning fire, says St. Paul. And fire consumes everything that it touches. And same with Almighty God. He wants to consume all of us so that all of us love him, every part of our being, and not in halves. We can't be, as, as, the, as Integrity Magazine used to say, Sunday Catholics. Mr. Business went to Mass. He never missed a Sunday. Mr. Business went to hell for what he did on Monday. We can't be schizophrenic Catholics. But in the modern society of separation of church and state, it's easy to be a schizophrenic Catholic. Because you go to Mass, <clears throat> you go to the church, everything is beautiful. God-centered, but then you go to work and it's, you go out to the world and it's godless, Christless, pagan. And for one who wants to please both, mammon and God, it, it can't happen, but they can try. They start becoming schizophrenic Catholics. And this is extremely dangerous. So it's better to just be Catholic. And at work, make the sign of the cross at grace. Don't join in the filthy talk and jokes. Be a good example. Give praise where praise is due. Be grateful. Don't join in into their filthy talk and filthy language and filthy jokes. <clears throat> and just be what our Lord wants us to be. So, 2.30... Quarter to three, our Lord has said his last words, seven last words. His last word will be, it is consummated. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And this he says, this was what the one, one of the one flaws that I saw in the film of Mel Gibson is our Lord, when he says, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit, he's, he's muttering, you can barely hear him. But St. John says, no, that's not what it was. Our Lord shouted with a loud voice, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And then bowed his head and died. So at 3 p.m. is our Lord's death. Quickly, what are the seven last words? What's the, what's the last sermon our, our Lord gave? First, Father, forgive them. Second, to the good thief, today thou wilt be with me in paradise. St. Dismas. And notice Dismas was not baptized with water. Against the Phenite error. He wasn't baptized with water. He was baptized by the burning desire and repentance. And our Lord canonizes him. So this is a teaching of the Catholic Church. Baptism of desire and blood are true, constant teachings of the Catholic Church. It is wrong to deny that. And only in the U.S. do you have that error of the Phenite heresy. Some call it a heresy. I think it's more accurate to call it an erroneous opinion. Because it smacks of heresy. And... <clears throat> Anyway, but without going into that subject, just to say the good thief was baptized by his desire. And our Lord's precious grace washed his soul.
by his repentance and, and promised him heaven, heaven, paradise. Thirdly, the, our Lord says to the Virgin Mary, Woman, behold thy son. Meaning, there's St. John, there's your son now. So you see the generosity, the goodness of our Lord. He gives his youngest apostle to Our Lady's care. Woman, behold thy son. And in, in St. John represents all the human race, given Mary as our mother. And then, son, behold your mother. That had to be an extremely moving and touching moment to hear that. Because our Lord is just drowning in pain and, and agony. And he's just thinking of us. He's thinking of the future church. He's thinking of his mother. It's like he doesn't care about himself. That selflessness that we see shining constantly in our divine Lord. And that's why motherhood is so beautiful. Motherhood is a constant self-giving. Constantly. The children are sick at night. She's got to get up and take care of them and attend to their fever. And a good husband will also help. Or they take turns and he'll be concerned about his wife not getting enough rest. That's what a good husband and man must do. But, uh, but when you boil down to it, it's the woman that's constantly giving of herself at the kitchen, preparing good meals, at the house, at the raising children and teaching them and correcting them. And children, yes, need to be corrected. We're in this liberal age where even many traditional families, they're not disciplining their own children. They don't spank them anymore. They don't uh, bring out the paddle anymore. They don't punish them anymore. Oh, because it's all bad and evil and we don't want to be considered mean parents. Well, you're being mean by not disciplining your children because you'll be visiting them in jail. They need to be disciplined and that's love. And any, ask any of these prisoners who've been there all their life, most of them say they hate their father because they never knew their father and he never loved them enough to discipline them. Because a father disciplines those he loves. And, this, and that's what the Holy Ghost says about our Heavenly Father. He dis disciplines those he loves. God chastises those he loves. And a good coach over a team, <laughs> if he gives them Coke and ice cream every practice, and you can sit around on the bleachers, throw the ball around, or pass the puck a little bit, first game they're going to be blown off the ice. They're not going to win any tournaments. They'll be packing up early for the end of the season. But a, a coach over a team that drills them hard with sprints, with killers. And in hockey, that's from the blue line, from the red line to the blue line back. Red line back, blue line back, far red line back. And then five laps, full speed to the right, and turn around five laps, full speed to the left, over and over again. By the end of practice, everyone is dripping sweat. That goes for any sport. And the coach is going to drill them hard. And the young men appreciate a hard driving coach, who's not an idiot, nor over severe, but a true man who, who knows how to have compassion, but knows how to push hard also. And our Lord is like that. And those teams, they win. They have success. Because they know sweat hard in practice, bleed less on the battlefield. Give 125% on practice, and you give 100% in the game. So... So it is with our Heavenly Father, and He chastises us. So parents, we can't get soft and gooey over our children. We have to love them correctly, and that part of that is disciplining them. And when you're, for the young people here, when you're ch parents, you have to remember that. That's part of the love, and the Holy, the Holy Ghost says that. Who spares the rod sends his child to hell. The rod and correction will save your child from hell. 
the rod that is, you know, the whack on the rear end, but also the gentle words to tell little Johnny, don't go crawling up on the, on the dinner table anymore. You have to stay in your seat. And they have to learn. So anyway, so our Lord, he is, at three o'clock, he shouts with a loud voice, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. He bows his head in obedience to the Father. And now the work of the redemption is almost complete. It's all complete by this time. But the final cherry on top will be the resurrection and the ascension. Our Lord's soul leaves his body and he runs like a giant running the way, says Psalm uh, 18, and he leaps down into limbo, the limbo of the fathers. And there our Lord comes like Samson and tears open the gates, pulls the gates and the bars right open, throws them down. He enters in as king. He enters in as the lion of the tribe of Judah, and even the devils feel the power of God in his soul. Now this is the soul of Christ, which is divine. And then on, on the top of the earth, you got the body of Christ buried in the sepulchre, being, being wrapped in the shroud and prepared by Nicodemus, Joseph Arimathea, St. John, and our Blessed Mother is there. But his body is also divine. So God is present in both. And St. Vincent Ferrer puts it this way. When you take an apple, you see the red peel. And when you cut it in half, you got the red peel and the white inside on both sides. So the white would be the divinity. It's on both sides, the body and the soul of Christ. So he comes down into limbo and brings the light of glory. They see the beatific vision from limbo. Our Lord opens it all up for them and turns limbo into paradise. So already the good fruits of the redemption are at work. And meanwhile, look at our Blessed Mother. All you that pass by the way, see if there is any sorrow like unto my sorrow. O oh, daughter of Jerusalem, who can console you? For deep as the sea is thy distress. And Our Lady, at the foot of the cross, she holds the very dead body of our Lord. That's another... Uh, had to be an extremely touching scene for St. John and St. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus to see just to see that, the real thing, the mother of Christ holding her dead son, the divine son. It had to be something just, how can you, I don't think any poetry can explain it. No piece of music can explain the beauty and the sorrow and the what's all involved in this beautiful scene of Our Lady holding the dead body of the living God. The baby Jesus she held in her arms and nursed. The baby Jesus, she changed his, his diapers. Of course, they were cloth diapers in those days. She saw him grow up. She tended to his scratches and wounds in the workshop of St. Joseph. She probably did maybe some stitching. And our Lord, uh, there he is. And she can see all over his body, all the, all the dried up spit the dirt, the shroud shows the dirt on the knees and on the face when our Lord fell on the way of the cross. The knees are full of dirt. The, the rocks and the, the dirt get right into the wounds deep. And when our Lord falls, he has no way to break the fall because his hands are tied and he lands right into the dirt with his head sandwiched between the thorns. Our Lord, our Blessed Mother, she reads the whole passion, every detail of it on his body. All the swollen cheeks from the punches, the holes in his beard from when they tore out chunks of his beard. She can see his eyes are half open and swollen and red from 
the tears and the, the crown of thorns on his head. Some of the thorns are so deep, they have to really pull to get them out because they're embedded in the, the skull bone itself. So our Lord would have had many concussions and did not go unconscious because he loves us. He's not going to go unconscious. He's going to thirst for us. He's going to suffer more for us. He's going to do the extreme of the love of God for our souls. Who could not love him in return? And yet, most don't. So God chose an audiovisual to shake us to love him and see the price of your soul. This Mary holding the dead body of Christ, that's the price tag of your soul. Each one of you, each one of us and our hearers, that's the price tag of your soul, the living God. And let's, let's just ask the angels. There's a saying in the scripture that says, what are these wounds in your hands and feet? And our Lord, this is what is said when he enters into at the ascension. What are these wounds in your hand and feet? And our Lord says, I received these from my friends. And the angels are watching, seeing the Virgin Mary holding the dead body of the living God. And the angels, they just, they just can't believe what they're seeing. That God has so loved the human race that he suffered all this for us and died. And there he is in the arms of his mother. The angels, that all they can do is adore. They cannot comprehend this mystery. And the devils are defeated. Because from now on, the, the wounds of Christ, the blood of Christ, makes them powerless. And this is what the Mass is. It reenacts all those wounds. And this is what we should say when we're tempted but to sin by the devil. Precious blood of Jesus, be my shield. Precious blood of Jesus, be my protection. St. Mag Maria Goretti, pray for me. St. Philomena, pray for me. St. Anthony, pray for me. We've got to fight against all these temptations of all sorts. So, three o'clock, our Lord is dead. Three o'clock, the veil in the temple is ripped from top to bottom, and then the tremendous earthquake. Graves are opened, and the ghosts of prophets walk through the streets, telling the Jews, you just killed the Messiah. You just committed deicide. You have the curse of God on you. And in 70, year 70, it will hit. Um... And then the, at the same time, the lamb in the temple is being stabbed by the high priest. Who's the high priest? Caiaphas, <laughs> the poor hypocrite. He's killing the lamb and the earthquake hits. And it's the end of the Jewish religion. And, the, the, and, then, the, and then Longinus, the soldier, and all the guards, they're converting. So Longinus converts. When he hears our Lord say, my God, my God, why hast thou abandoned me? This is the, the high priest intoning the Psalm 21. And then I thirst, it is finished. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. The seven last words. These were all heard by Longinus. And he's the one that spears, pierces the heart of Jesus and blood and water flow out. Some say Longinus was blind in one eye, and after he was splashed, he could see miraculously. Longinus will then seek out the apostles and the Virgin Mary, and he'll be baptized. He will profess the Catholic faith. He will die a martyr later in his life. Tremendous. And probably, <clears throat> since he was a captain over a centurion, over a hundred men, there's no doubt a lot of the soldiers would have converted with him. Four o'clock, our Lord is pierced in his, with a lance. Five o'clock, he's taken down from the cross, placed in our Blessed Mother's arms. And then six o'clock is the burial in the sepulchre. And then they set Roman guards at the request of the Jews to guard the tomb. 
So here we are. It is now 2.40. It's 20 minutes to 3 on that first Good Friday. This was the peak of the agony of our Lord's suffering, the peak of the agony of our Blessed Mother. And Our Lady, she will, after our Lord is buried, she will walk again to Calvary. She will go and see all the blood stain of the way of the cross back to the scourging. She'll see all that. And Mary of Agreda says that the angels gathered all their blood and uh, protected the precious blood of Jesus. And then one last point is that the time of the resurrection was supposed to be longer, three full days. But the Virgin Mary told Mary of Agreda that our Lord shortened the time of the resurrection, made it sooner, out of compassion for his mother. But she continued to suffer the, the whole way of the cross. So think about that. On Good Friday night, Our Lady, there's no way she slept. She would have just heard the pounding of the nails, the panting of air of her son, the blasphemies, the mockery. She, she kept rewinding that whole event in her mind and in her heart. And then Saturday, she does the way of the cross. She's the first to do the way of the cross. She goes through it all again with St. John. And then Saturday night, she finally... The apostles, who have lost the faith, they convince her have something to eat at least. Mary of, Cleoph Cleoph Mary of Cleophas and Mary of Salome, Mary Magdalene. Our Lady has something finally to eat and drink and she falls asleep. And she will have a good rest until three in the morning on Easter Sunday when our Lord will wake her up with filling her room with a bright light. So on this Good Friday, let's go now to honor the Virgin Mary. This will be our last devotion of the day here at the very hour that our Lord dies. And it will be the devotion to the Sorrowful Mother. So I'll pass out these booklets. We will begin it promptly. On page 9a, the Act of Contrition, page 9b, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Virgin most afflicted. How ungrateful have I been in the past to my God in return for all his benefits. Now I repent in bitterness of heart, humbly asking pardon for the offense done to his infinite goodness, and resolve by the help of heavenly grace to offend him no more. Ah, by all the pains which thou didst suffer in the cruel passion of thy dear Jesus, I pray thee with fervent sighs to obtain for me pardon and mercy. For all my grievous sins, receive this holy exercise wherein I am going to engage in memory of thy sorrows. Attain that the same sword which pierced thy soul may pierce mine also, that I may live and die in the love of my Lord, and share eternally in that glory which he has purchased for me with his most precious blood. Amen. And on page 34, you have the stanzas for the Stabat Mater. At the cross her station keeping Stood the mournful mother weeping Close to Jesus to the 
the first station on page 10a, the prophecy of Simeon. How great was the shock to Mary's heart at hearing the sorrowful words in which holy Simeon told the bitter passion and death of her sweet Jesus, since in that same moment she realized in her mind all the insults, blows, and torments which the impious men were to offer to the Redeemer of the world. But a still sharper sword pierced her soul. It was the thought of men's ingratitude to her beloved Son. Now consider that because of thy sins thou art unhappily among the ungrateful, and casting thyself at the feet of the mother of dolors, say with sorrow, Virgin beloved, who didst feel so bitter pangs of soul, at seeing the abuse which I, wretch that I am, would make of the blood of thy dear Son. Obtain for me, I pray thee, by thy riven heart, that in time to come I may better correspond to God's mercies, profit by his heavenly grace, receive not in vain his lights and inspirations, and so be among the blessed number of those who are saved by the bitter passion of Jesus. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Virgin most sorrowful, page 34. Through her heart is sorrow sharing. The second sorrow of Our Lady, the flight into Egypt. Consider the sharp sorrow which Mary felt when St. Joseph, being warned by an angel, she had to flee by night in order to preserve her beloved child from the slaughter de decreed by Herod. What anguish was hers in leaving Judea, lest she should be overtaken by the soldiers of the cruel king. How great her privations in that long journey. What suffering she bore in that land of exile, what sorrow amid the people given to idolatry. But consider how often thou hast renewed that bitter grief of Mary, when thy sins have caused her son to flee from thy heart. Wherefore repent and turn to her humbly, saying, Sweetest mother, once and once only Herod obliged thee to fly with thy Jesus, to escape the slaughter which he had commanded. But I, how often have I forced my Redeemer and thee with him to fly from my heart when I have admitted it into it a cursed sin, hateful to thee and to my loving Lord. With tears and contrition I humbly sue for pardon. Mercy, dear lady mine, mercy. And I promise thee that for the future with the help of God, I will ever maintain my Savior in thee in complete possession of my soul. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Virgin most sorrowful, pray for us. Oh, how sad and sore distress. The third sorrow of Our Lady, the loss of Jesus in the temple. How dread was the grief of Mary when she saw that she had lost her beloved son. And as if to increase her sorrow, when she <coughs> sought and did diligently among her kinsfolk and acquaintance, she could hear no tidings of him. No hindrances stayed her, nor weariness, nor danger, but she forthwith returned to Jerusalem and for three long days sought him sorrowing. Great be thy confusion, O my soul, who has so often lost thy Jesus by thy sins, and has given no heed to seek him at once. 
a sign that thou dost make of very little or of no account the precious treasure of divine love. Weep then for thy blindness, and turning thee to the Lady of Sighs, thy mother, say with compunction, Virgin most afflicted, obtain that I may learn from thee to seek Jesus when I have lost him by giving ear to my passions and to the evil suggestions of the devil. Obtain that I may find him again, and when I possess him once more, that I may ever repeat the words of the spouse, I found him whom my soul loveth, I held him, and I will not let him go. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Virgin most sorrowful, Christ above in torment The fourth sorrow, Mary meets Jesus on the way to Calvary. Come, O ye sinners, come and see if you can endure so sad a sight. This mother, so tender and loving, meets her beloved son, meets him amid an impious rabble, who drag him to a cruel death, wounded, torn by stripes, crowned with thorns, streaming with blood, buried in his heavy cross. Ah, consider, my soul, the grief of the Blessed Virgin thus beholding her son. Who would not weep at seeing this mother's grief? But who has been the cause of such woe? I, it is I, who with my sins have so cruelly wounded the heart of my sorrowful mother. And yet I am not moved, I am as a stone, when my heart should break because of my ingratitude. O Virgin Most Holy, I crave pardon for the sorrows I have caused thee. I know and confess that I deserve it not, for it is I through whom thy Jesus was so treated. Yet do thou call to mind that thou art the mother of mercy. Show mercy then to me, and I promise to be more faithful to my Redeemer in the time to come. And thus to console thee for the many sorrows I have offered to thine afflicted heart. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, <coughs> Virgin most sorrowful, is there one who would not weep? Wound in misery so deep, Christ, dear mother, to me. The fifth sorrow of Our Lady, Jesus dies on the cross. Look, devout soul, look to Calvary, whereon are raised two altars of sacrifice, one on the body of Jesus, the other on the heart of Mary. Sad is the sight of that dear mother, drowned in a sea of woe, seeing her beloved son, part of her very self, cruelly nailed to the shameful tree of the cross. Ah me, how every blow of the hammer, how every stripe which fell on the Saviour's form, fell also on the disconsolate spirit of the Virgin. As she stood at the foot of the cross, pierced by the sword of sorrow, she turned her eyes on him until she knew that he lived no longer and had resigned his spirit to his eternal Father. Then her own soul was like to have left the body and joined itself to that of Jesus. O Mother of Sorrows, who would not leave Calvary until thou hast drunk the last drop of the chalice of thy woe? How great is my confusion of face, that I so often refuse to take up my cross, and in all ways endeavor to avoid those slight sufferings which the Lord for my good is pleased to send upon me. Obtain for me, I pray thee, that I may see clearly the value of suffering, and may be enabled, if not to cry with St. Francis Xavier, more to suffer, my God, ah, more, at least to bear meekly 
all my crosses and trials. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Virgin most sorrowful, can the human heart refrain from partaking in her pain? In that mother's pain The sixth sorrow, Mary receives the dead body of Jesus in her arms. Consider the most bitter sorrow which rent the soul of Mary when she saw the dead body of her dear Jesus on her knees, covered with blood, all torn with deep wounds. O oh, mournful mother, a bundle of myrrh indeed is thy beloved to me, who would not pity thee, whose heart would not be soft in seeing affliction which would move a stone. Behold John not to be comforted, Magdalene and the other Mary in deep affliction, and Nicodemus, who can scarcely bear his sorrow. And I, shall I alone be tearless amid such grief? Ingrate and hard am I. Grant, dear mother, that my heart may be pierced with the same sword that pierced thy sorrowful soul, that it may be softened and may indeed lament those my heavy sins, which were the cause of thy cruel sufferings. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Virgin most sorrowful, Bruce divine, cursed fire. The last and seventh <clears throat> sorrow of Our Lady, Jesus is placed in the tomb. Consider the sighs which burst from Mary's sad heart when she saw her beloved Jesus laid within the tomb. What grief was hers when she saw the stone lifted to cover that sacred tomb. She gazed the last time on the lifeless body of her son and could scarce detach her eyes from those gaping wounds. And when the great stone was rolled to the door of the sepulchre, oh, then indeed her heart seemed torn from her body. O oh, mother most desolate, who didst indeed in body depart from the sepulchre, but didst leave thy heart where was thine only treasure, obtain that all our desires, all our love may rest there with thee. Surely our hearts must melt with love to our Savior, who has shed his blood for our salvation. Surely we must love thee, who has suffered so much for us. O oh, by all thy sorrows, grant that the memory of them may be ever imprinted on our mind, that our hearts may burn with love to God and to thee, sweet Mother, who didst pour out all thy soul in sorrow for the passion of Jesus. To him be honor, glory, and thanksgiving forever and ever. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Virgin most sorrowful, pray for us. For the sins of his own nation, saw him hang in Till his spirit forth be sent. To Mary in her desolation, on page 22c. I pity thee, most holy mother, with all the tenderness of which my heart is capable, in thine extreme desolation. Deep indeed was thy grief when thou didst witness the passion and death of thy beloved son. But then his presence could in a measure sustain thee and comfort thee in the stormy waves of sorrow. Now, 
all by thy grievous lost, have pity on me, who so often have by my sins lost my beloved Lord. Obtain, O tender mother, that I may never again cause my Jesus to remove from me through my wickedness and want of fervor, but may serve him faithfully in this earthly life to see and enjoy him hereafter. Three Hail Marys at this three o'clock hour on Good Friday to console the Immaculate Heart of Mary in honor of her tears. Three Hail Marys. And here you want to ask anything great, anything big in God's eyes for our own salvation, our own soul, family, relatives, friends, souls in purgatory. Ask big and great requests at this hour of Christ's death and the, the morning of Our Lady as she watches our Lord be taken down from the cross and the rigor mortis setting in and she holds his dead body. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Sorrowful and immaculate heart of Mary. Saint Joseph, Saint Joseph of Arimathea, Saint John, Saint Mary Magdalene, Saint Dismas, Saint Longinus, Saint Mary of Salome, Saint Mary of Cleophas, all ye holy apostles. Benedictio Dei Omnipotentis, Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Descenda sobre vos in manus semper. Amen. Remember, it is a genuflection in and out of the chapel because of the unveiled crucifix.